And Diane, hey, congratulations on your documentary, Salt in My Soul. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It, it is a fascinating uh, feel good feel good documentary, but uh, tell, tell us what sparked uh, you folks to do this documentary? Well, um, I was sent the book by Richard Abate, who's one of the producers on the film, uh, at the end of 2019, I think the same year it was published. Um, and he had been very instrumental in getting the book published. Um, and he had always thought it would make a great film and um, send it to me. And I read it in one sitting, was completely blown away by it and knew he was right that it would make, I thought, a great documentary. Um, so he put me on the phone with Diane and... Um, the rest is history. <laughs> so, so Diane, what, what, what did Will say to you to convince you to uh, be part of this? Well, actually, it wasn't Will who convinced me. It was Richard, his partner, mm -hmm. his producing partner, who I knew and I had come to trust because he handled the material so well. And he said to me, I have the guy to make your film. He's a perfect documentarian. You're going to love working with him. So he came in the door with a really high recommendation from somebody I really respect. But that said, it took a while to trust him. And it took a while for us to figure out how to work together in a way that allowed him to be the creative visionary filmmaker, but me as the guardian of Mallory's material to feel as if it was protected and going to be presented the way I felt it needed to be presented because you always hear stories about people who take your material out of context or misrepresent or have a different agenda. And it was really blind trust, but based on a recommendation of somebody I respect. And over time, I think the process got better. And I'm sure Will will speak more to this about how COVID was actually helpful to this process. You want to take that baton? Thank you, as you hand it off. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we managed to shoot... Um, I would say it's 95% of what I wanted to shoot before lockdown in 2020. Um, and, um, you know, and then the, 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 one of the few positives about the, the shutdown was honestly, it gave us a lot of time in post-production. It gave me a lot of time to get to know Mallory, uh, you know, cause I was coming in cold. I'd never had the privilege of meeting her. Um, and, you know, it gave us a lot of time to sift through the extraordinary amount of material, you know, um, there was obviously the, the, the memoir uh, that Diane discovered on Mallory's computer after her death. There are also, you know, hundreds of hours of audio recordings. You know, Mallory was very into podcasts, but also into recording, you know, sort of, uh, she organized her thoughts a lot uh, by recording herself in, in audio recordings. Um, and she recorded a lot of, um, you know, audio. There's like the fight between her and Diane in the movie. You know, I, I think she just recorded it in case she either wanted it, wanted to use it for something in the future. Um, you know, and then there was the extraordinary footage um, that we had. So, um, yeah, it was, you know, the, the shoot was a little truncated, but, you know, the, the actual editing process was really, um, was, was really rich and long. Well, what, was, it, was it challenging for you to uh, do a documentary uh, without, uh, basically, uh, without the subject in hand um, and just, uh, just, you know, going through like, you know, through, through other subjects to talk about your, your main. It was, you know, and, and, I, and I, my initial gut, my hunch about how to make the film made it even more challenging, which was that, you know, I, I knew I wanted Mallory to be the narrator of the film too, um, you know, which, um, you know, because it was very much her story, right? You know, and it's a, it's a coming of age story. Um, and so that, that I knew posed the challenge, you know, and so we had to go and find, you know, sometimes I had a thought about, you know, a scene or a moment or a theme or an issue that I wanted to raise, you know, and we had to go and try and find Mallory talking about that or, you know, framing that for us. Um, but um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, one of the great things about having Diane as a resource um, during it, you know, because it's not, you know, it's not a, an aha doc, it's not, we're not exposing some grand scandal, you know, it's much more of a kind of coming of age story, if you will, with all of these kind of, you know, the theme, the thematic offshoots. Um, but, you know, it was, it was great having Diane as a resource, um, because it opened up two avenues for me, you know, it obviously gave me the inside on Mallory, you know, and, and who she was, and, you know, what, 
you know, and, and, and also, you know, somebody who had lived the story so closely, you know, so that, you know, there were moments where I had very specific questions about, you know, well, who was in that room at that time, um, you know, and, and then it also opened up this other piece of the film for me where I realized um, that the sort of, you know, my perspective on the film, you know, what I was shooting, the interviews and everything, it was really the perspective of grief because all of the people I was speaking to, they weren't living in that moment with Mallory. Now, Mallory is narrating the film in the moment, but the people, the other people are in, you know, they're grieving, you know, they're, they're, they're a year, they're two years out from her death. Um, you know, so being able to speak to Diane actually gave me both of those, because of course Diane was, you know, is still grieving in her own way. And so, um, it, you know, and then, you know, and one of the other things I would say is making it when we did, I, I realized sort of after the fact that we also ended up making this film that was very much a metaphor for what, everyone in the world was going through, you know, with the lockdown, isolation, mask wearing, respirators, you know, that all is very much the cystic fibrosis world. Um, so um, it ended up being an incredibly uh, valuable sort of process that, and, and the way, and I would never have worked that closely with somebody that, you know, involves with the subject either. Um, you know, so I don't know, I, I, I think I, I got to know Mallory. I, I was emailing with a lot of her friends who I interviewed last week you know, and I still have that sense that I, I desperately hope I did her justice because she was obviously an extraordinary person. Um, that's my hope. <laughs> I, I haven't shared this yet, but I and I hope I don't get in trouble for sharing this. But originally, when we were working on the film, and I wanted Will to cut me out because I just didn't. I wanted to be the publicist and the mom, not the subject in the film. And he said, "But you know, my wife says you're her favorite character." And then months and months and months later, during this collaborative creative collision. He said to me, yeah, my wife always knows when I'm on the phone with you because my blood pressure goes up. And I just, <laughs> I just thought that describes the experience because we would get into these really heated conversations. But I think what it did, I think it forced us to expand the story, to think outside of the, the, the tunnel vision. I, I won't speak for Will. The tunnel vision I had, which is this is a film about a girl who wrote a book that's extraordinary and is going to teach us so much through her words my perspective of Will was that he was telling a story about a girl, a whole story, not just necessarily focusing on the writing, but in the beautifully edited and produced film that he has made, we have come to understand that it does speak to many different issues, invisible illness, mental health, superbugs, environmental erosion, the connection to human sickness, antimicrobial resistance. Am I missing anything? It's just, and all of these different groups that are seeing the film and planning events around it are showing us that they're looking at the film with their filter. And I think that is what happens with people. And I do think the beauty of this film is the way Will produced it and directed it. It ends up being a piece that will speak to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. Diane, um, can you t tell us, talk to us about, uh, you know, the, how, how this documentary yeah, helped you through the grieving process? I mean, it must be very difficult to re revisit all of this. It is, and I shed a lot of tears, and I still cry all the time. I gave a talk to a medical school in Israel yesterday in the morning, and I had to fight back the tears. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I've done this talk 200 times. How come I cannot get through this without crying? And it's just because it's just the story is still stunning to me and staggering in how it happened and how close she came to having her life saved and to how much she had to offer this world and how we see all these horrible people who are committing all kinds of crimes and doing terrible things in this world and they run free and my perfect specimen of a daughter isn't here. But what the film does and what the book does and what the talks do and what these interviews do is allows me to keep talking about Mallory and to keep her alive. I am not a Buddhist, but I read a Buddhist saying that says a person dies twice once when they physically leave us and the second when we stop talking about them. So for me, this is an opportunity to continue to share my daughter with the world and not be, oh my God, there's that mom that can't get over the death of her daughter. So it gives me permission to speak about her as much as I want. And that's the best gift of all. So in, in both of your opinions, you, you believe that this is probably Mallory's wish is to have a documentary. I, I know she, she wished to have a book, but, uh, but but this is this is probably furthest from her, um, her mind at, at that time. 
I don't think she ever in her wildest dreams would envision that people would want to see her story. She was very, very modest, very humble, very quiet. And if you read anything, somebody, one of her coaches named Marla Weiss, who's, there's another book coming out about CF and they interviewed her about Mallory. And I read the, the passage yesterday and it basically, she said she was a respected, quiet leader. She led by her actions, by her determination, by her vision and by what she didn't say, not what she did say. And I thought that was a really interesting way to describe Mallory. So I think this would have been a big surprise to her. I think it would be a big surprise to know that three years later, I'm still sharing her story and venues all over the country to really important audiences that are taking great meaning and leaving feeling better and more enlightened. So I wish she was here to see it. Absolutely. Well, um, tell us about, uh, um, and Diane could jump in if she, she wants to, it's uh, tell us about gathering all these subjects um, for your documentary and actually convincing them to, uh, to participate. Yeah, most of them were very willing, thankfully, you know, and, and, and Diane and I, in our early conversations, that was very important to me to, to figure out, you know, who from the book was going to be willing to talk, um, you know, because there were there were certain people that I knew we absolutely had to have, you know, Jack, uh, you know, the, 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 the man she fell in love with sort of towards the end of her life, um, you know, some of the doctors uh, were very, very important. Um, you know, and then um, it was kind of the logistics of, you know, getting it all together. And, um, and you know, in a funny way, getting the interviews wasn't really the hard part. It was actually conducting the interviews that I found incredibly um, difficult is the wrong word. But, you know, it was just so emotional, like, you know, and because, and you know, people, you know, a, a lot of her friends had been very surprised by certainly the kind of the mental health questions that were raised in Mallory's memoir when it was published, you know, that people really hadn't known how much she'd suffered. Um, and I think, you know, revisiting that with people in the interviews was very, um, was very difficult. You know, I mean, again, I, I've never cried so much while interviewing people, you know, you tend to feel like you're going to have a bit, a little bit of distance, um, from it. Um, and, um, and that was, it was actually very, um, it was one of the best parts of making this film for me actually was, you know, I, I really, um, went on a journey myself, you know, and, and then, you know, in, in sort of putting it, putting them together, um, you know, wanting to be incredibly respectful about those people, you know, what they shared, because they, all of them have been very raw, you know, and, and it's, and it's interesting, you asked that question about whether Mallory would have wanted a documentary, and I, I always come back to that tweet she sent, um, you know, about, you know, her GI problems, you know, and I think she would have hated that, <laughs> you know, the world knew about those, honestly, um, you know, so I actually, I really tried to soft pedal that a little bit, because it's a huge issue for CF patients, you know, the CF affects all of your organs where mucus, you know, and the movement of mucus is so important, and one of the biggies there is your, you know, your GI tracts, right, um, you know, so I really wanted to be I wanted it to be truthful, I wanted it to be impactful, I wanted the audience to really understand the suffering both of, you know, that Mallory went through, but th these people went through without it becoming sort of maudlin, depressing or, or defining, you know, and that, that was the sort of trick of all of this, you know, of, of both treating Mallory as a subject, but also all of the interviews, um, you know, is that, is that they all had that, that double, uh, that quality, that, that, that sort of dichotomy and that, you know, there, there was, there's a great deal of love and happiness and there's a great deal of sadness and tragedy in all of it, you know, so that was, that was probably the hardest thing for my editor and I to really to, to manage that that journey for the audience. Wow, and um, and Diane, I I know you you helped out Will a lot by gathering um, a lot of old footage of um, of Mallory because we, we we know Mallory kept a diary and she kept a uh, you know a lot a lot of this stuff probably meticulously all in one on one laptop. But uh, could you tell about the search for you know all the other footages um, to help out Will? Well, you know, it's interesting. She was chosen to give the graduation speech in high school and I had never seen it. And when Will was pressing me to find more material, I was digging through files and folders and boxes and I came across a DVD and I said, oh my God, I found it. And we looked at it and there she was. And it was this, and there was no sound on it. And I was just devastated. And Will, like, he didn't let up. He said, find it, find it, find it, find it. Ask somebody, somebody's got it, somebody's got it. He pushed me hard. And um, he was right, because I sent out kind of an APB to the community, and somebody had it. And so I got it. And that's how that's in there. And 
It was the same thing with the Jacob Jonas footage of the sit down interview with Mallory. I'd known about it because it happened in my house. I didn't stay in the room when it happened because that would have upset Mallory. So I disappeared, but I knew it was here and I knew it existed. And then um, I asked him for it, but I never had really ever looked at it. And then, you know, there was a discussion of, do you use somebody else's footage in the film? But then Will made the decision there was a way to integrate it. And so it happened like that. I kept pressuring people. And the crazy thing is, a lot of people, it took like 10 times me asking. I mean, I asked them at the time of the memorial. I asked everybody, send me everything you have. But then when I say, oh, there's this film and the director is asking, all of a sudden people started producing. It's like, where have you been with all of this stuff? But I think there's a gravitas that comes when a documentary is being made about somebody and people behave very differently. And all of a sudden everybody was coming up with all kinds of stuff that I hadn't seen. And now people will periodically send me pictures that I haven't seen, although... I, I, one of the things that Will and I debated a lot was memory, because one of the things that was hard for me was to hear people recount stories or episodes or things that had happened that didn't happen that way. And I know because of my memory and I know because I have it in writing from Mallory's book, but Will didn't care. And he sort of taught me that people's memories are just that, their memories, it's their reality. It's how they process it and that they have the right to remember things the way they do. That was a, hard, a little bit about challenge for me. And there's a couple of moments in the film where I'm like, hey, it doesn't go down that way, but okay. And now, I, you know, now I've kind of let that go. But it, it's been an interesting process and journey. And, um, and I think that I, I have said, and I will say again, there are not very many people, and it might be Will, might be the one person that I would allow to speak on my behalf if something happened. You know, even my husband, he wasn't, he was he could just speak about all the phage therapy stuff, but I don't know that he really paid attention as much to the nuances, but I think Will, with the gift of COVID lockdown, really immersed himself in the material. And I think he has participated in all of these conversations that we're having with all these different groups about how people are interpreting the film and what they're hoping to do with it and the different topics. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is organ donation. That's a huge issue. And this is not a preachy film about the need for organ donation. And yet, there is a huge need for organ donation, and this film does remind us of that. And so Will has been every step of this journey, you know, from shooting it, you know, editing it, and now working on this post-production and now the publicity. It's, you do learn the story, and he is very immersed. And so now I, I trust him in a way that I did not trust him two years ago. That is certainly a happy result. And yes. And, and Will, you even had a further uh, touch upon us by having people read a certain passage um, out of that book. Could you tell us about coming to that decision and which and how you, you chose that passage? Or did Diane chose that passage? Who, who, someone she, she, no, she did not. Um, I, no, I, I, I actually, I was rereading the book uh, on the plane on my way out to California um, and I, and I was just completely sort of struck by it, you know, and, and just because it's so full of, yeah, again, it's so full of happiness and hope and sadness, you know, and it's all contained in the writing and it's such a beautiful piece of writing. And it, it touches on, you know, all of the relation, you know, so many of the relationships she had as well. Um, and, and I'd honestly, I mean, I, this, is, this is an exclusive gig that I'm giving you. I had originally thought it would just be Diane reading that passage. That was kind of in my head. And I, and I was sort of thinking, oh, I should have everybody read a different passage. And um, the, the poor person, and here's, here's for everybody at home can do this. There's one person who's interviewed in the film that doesn't read that passage. And it's simply because they were my first interview. Diane was my second on that trip. So I hadn't had anyone read it until Diane read it. And as soon as Diane read that passage, the light bulb went off for me. I was like, oh, everyone needs to read the same passage. So there's this one poor person who I interviewed before Diane who isn't reading that passage. And I've always felt terrible about that um, when we started putting it together. But um, no, it was, again, you know, it's one of those, part, you know, magic of the process, right? They, you know, you, you stay open. And as, and as soon as I heard it, I, I, I realized, you know, so we had every, that's why we had everybody subsequently read that same passage. Um, and it was funny, you know, because, it's so rare that those kind of ideas you have in production last, you know, and, and can survive, you know, a year of editing. Um, but I think that that was the ending of the film from very, very early on. Absolutely. 
Well, let, let me wrap it up with one last question as audiences uh, are, are going to check out your documentary, Salt in My Soul is, what is the one most important take that you hope that people would walk away with after viewing your documentary? Gosh, I have to choose one. Um, I suppose, I think the extraordinary thing about Mallory is, you know, that she went through a level of suffering that most of us won't know. And she still found a love of the environment, of writing, of friends, of lovers, you know, and I think that it's that, you know, we've all gone through this incredibly tough time, you know, and we've all been isolated and we've all been depressed and sad. And yet I think what Mallory can show is that it's worth having a little resilience. It's worth getting out of bed every day because something special can happen. Wow. Well, I guess we could hear uh, Diane's take on it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, I've always thought that the message of the film is carpe diem, seize the day. But in talking to Will, he's actually made me look at the film a different way. And that the, le the lesson to take away is that we all need love. We need to give it and we need to take it. And I did, I did... I didn't really think about the theme of love. And as a matter of fact, when he first raised that point, I thought it was a little bit like corny, you know, and, and, and Will's not really a corny person at all. So it was really a bit of a surprise and it didn't play well with me. I was like, what does that even mean? But I do think that, um, and, it, and it does tie into Carpe Diem, which is life is short. We don't know how long we have. Make sure you love the people that you love and, you know, give it and get it. And don't waste any time. And if you're, you know, don't sweat the small stuff because life is short and it's a beautiful thing to be here. And also the last, I guess the last thing, I know you only asked for one, but personal story, hearing people's message and what they have to say and letting them tell it in their own way, I think is really important. And Will did a beautiful job since Mallory isn't here to speak for herself. He's created a film that lets people see who she is. And that is, that's quite meaningful. That is terrific. Well, this, uh, this, this movie is full of messages. Everyone should check out uh, Salt in My Soul. Will, Diane, thank you very much for speaking to us about this fascinating documentary. Thank you. Thank you so much.